Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can uh, look at your word and, and discuss an important topic this morning. Lord, I, I pray that we would be encouraged by what we heard from Pastor John this morning, that we should expect suffering and trials in this life, but know that if we share in Christ's sufferings, we will also share in his glory. I pray that that would be marking our lives as we go out this week. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So I want to start by asking, hmm, all right, there you go, yep, yep, there we go. I want, this is a question I want to hear your answers to, and it's a bigger, big question, and I don't think we need to get the, the definitive answer on, on this, but I want your thoughts, and when you think about, you know, the West, it's, it's pretty clear when you look at the statistics that um, Christianity is declining in the West. And you might want to qualify that and say, well, you know, it depends on what churches you're looking at because some churches are growing and other churches are declining. A lot of the more mainline ones are. But regardless, the Western culture is becoming increasingly secularized. And so I think it is true, at least in a broad sense, that Christianity is declining in the West. Its influence, at least, is declining. And I want to ask other question, why do we think that is? Again, there's probably multiple causes, so I don't want us to get hung up on like, well, this is the right answer, but why, why do you think Christianity is declining in the West? You can just shout out answers. Yeah, so an, in, an intentional, yeah, an intentional plan of, of, you know, kind of destroying it. Yeah, what else? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of just the secular nature of Western culture, and well, we don't need Christianity anymore. Any other ideas as to why it's declining? Yeah, Jesus definitely, he tells his disciples, you know, if the world hated me, you know, it's not going to just jump all over you and be like, oh, you guys are the best things since sliced bread. No, it will hate you as well. Well, this has been a question that you know, maybe we feel like we're dealing with now, but, you know, you read um, Christians throughout the past, and that's kind of a question, maybe not about specifically the West, but in every generation, Christians are wrestling with the fact of, you know, why does, when you look around at the world, it, it doesn't seem that, that Christianity is, um, it often seems that, it, that it's declining or not flourishing. Um, all the way back in the 1600s, now this isn't working again. I have to click it. All the way back in the 1600s, the late 1600s, which was probably compared to our time, much more, um, here we go, much more religious, certainly. That it was kind of like the, the, the height of the Puritan age in England. This is what the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith says in its introduction. So it's writing, it's, it's introducing this great uh, statement of Baptistic faith. And at the very end of the introduction, this is what they say. They say this, And verily, there is one spring and cause of the decay of religion in our day, which we cannot but touch upon and earnestly urge a redress of, and that is the neglect of the worship of God and families, to those, uh, by those to whom the charge and conduct of them is committed. In other words, these pastors and theologians who are writing this confession of faith, at the end of the introduction said, we can't get it go on before just addressing just this one thing that, you know, we can't leave out that we see as a spring and cause of the decay of religion in our day. And they say, you know what, we, we think it is the neglect of worship in families, the neglect of family worship. That's what, how um, central they viewed it as. Uh, we could go on. Uh, let me just give you one more quote. This is from the London Baptist Confession, chapter 22. And by the way, this is, if you look at the London Baptist Confession, it's the same as the Westminster Confession, which was the Presbyterian document. It's the same as the Savoy Declaration, which was the Congregationalist document. They were all uh, very similar, and they all say this exact same thing. This is chapter 22, Paragraph 6 says, God is to be worshipped everywhere in spirit and in truth. And then it highlights three different ways. As in private families daily and in secret, each one by himself, so more solemnly in the public assemblies, which are not carelessly nor willfully to be neglected or forsaken, when God, when God by his word or providence calleth 
thereunto. So it identifies three different ways God is to be worshipped in private and secretly, uh, in our families, and also in the body of the church. So this is another discussion question. I just want to ask, what did family worship or family devotions look like for you guys growing up? So think back, some of us, not so long, others of us, longer, to when you were a kid growing up, what did family devotions look like? I expect we're going to have a range from totally absent um, to fairly consistent. But I just want to hear, what, what did they look like for you guys growing up? Complete absence, yeah. Which you wouldn't expect if, you know, you, know, you wouldn't expect to have them if, if they aren't believers, yeah. Mm -hmm. So pray, praying before meals and, and some, some talking about it, yeah. What else? Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Mm. That's especially holy because of the flannel graph. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My experience growing up is beyond church. When I think back, it was like sporadic. You know, we'd go through phases of we'd have consistent family divisions for a time and then not for a time, and then we'd do it again. And it wasn't like a very regular thing. It was kind of more sporadic. Um, but, yeah, there's a... I ask this question not so that we can look back and maybe disparage, you know, our parents and how they raised us. Um, but my goal is so that, you know, seeing that we come from different places, and the goal of this is like, well, we should all then, let's just try to take the next step um, forward. I do want to clarify as well. This is a series we're going to be looking at for five weeks. It's not only for like families with little kids or families with, with, with children. Um, that's not all this is for. Um, it certainly does apply to them. That's the context I'm in. I have little ones. Um, but this is for families in general. You know, if you have even just a spouse, you're a family. And the principles that we're going to be talking about really um, they apply equally to, to private devotion. So the model that we're going to be looking at is going to apply, you know, equally to private devotions and something that you could adopt um, for yourself. So I hope we can all get something out of this here. Um, here's a little outline of where we're going in the next five weeks. So this week we're going to be looking at the Bible and we're going to look at some passages that kind of lay out the foundation uh, of worship and families. Next week uh, we're going to look at reading the Bible together. The week after that, about singing together. The week after that, praying together. And then the final week will be kind of a tips and tricks grab bag of, you know, putting it into practice and some, you know, practical help for that. And I'll just tell you, this is the week that will have probably the most um, material, so to speak. We are in the next coming weeks. It's going to be a lot of practice together. So... I'm not saying this so that you can make sure you don't come the next weeks, but come, and we're going to get in groups, and guess what we're going to do in groups? We're going to practice these things together. Um, so it'll be a little bit less on the uh, talking side for me and more on the interacting side with all of us. So um, before we jump into the Bible section, I do want to also lay out the, the motives for, for family worship. These I've taken from uh, this this guy, his name is French, so I won't even pretend to know how to pronounce it, but it's a little a Frenchman who lived from 1794 to 1872, and he wrote this little booklet on family worship. And in there, he gives you know these motivations for family worship, trying to stir up uh, the people he's writing to and encourage them. And these are the motivations he gives. First, the glory of God. So why, why should we do this? Well, we, we do it for the glory of God um, because we think it's something his word directs us to do, and we want our families to be ones that, that glorify God together. Second, we do it to protect our families, particularly, now this one is geared towards children, to protect um, children um, as we live in an age where there is increasing secularization, increasing bombardment of, you know, lies to them and, and distractions and temptations, call them away. Well, this is a way to ground them in the faith and protect them from sin. Uh, third, to produce real joy. This is one I love. Um, I don't know if it was him who said this, but I have written there that, you know, family worship should really be kind of like a little taste 
of heaven, a thing that we enjoy, that we get to do together as families. Um, so it's to produce joy in the home. Its purpose is not to beat down, not to discourage, not to, you know, lay heavy duties upon it, but really to produce joy as we contemplate Christ together. Fourth, to prepare for trials. Um, there's a heartbreaking but moving story of um, John Patton. John Patton was a missionary in, I believe, the 1800s to the New Hebrides. Uh, these are uh, little islands in the Pacific Ocean. And he was ministering to a very, very tough place. Um, cannibalism was around. And uh, he, uh, in, in his autobiography, writes of a time when he and his wife both fell seriously ill. Um, they, they were laid in bed. And they were like the only, you know, the only Westerners there. They had, they had come. They got periodic like visits from, from others to support them. But but they were the only ones there. They had fallen sick. They didn't, you know, have a doctor they could go to. And they had young children, or an infant in particular. And the infant fell sick as well and died and passed away. And, and John Patton writes in his autobiography of, of hearing his older two children, who are probably like, you know, 12 and 10, something like that. I, I don't know their exact ages. But they, they took the infant, um, buried the infant out in their yard, and were singing hymns to God um, as they did that in mourning. You know, ones that they would have known and learned um, because they worshiped together as a family, which also when you read his autobiography is something that his father passed on to him. So it's to console in times of trial. Right? We, we heard about those this morning. We will all go through them. And this will be a bedrock for our families in those. And then lastly, to influence society. This is an interesting one. But I think it's significant. Um, you know, there's kind of a trite phrase, like, the children are our future. And there's a trite way of saying that. But there's also just a basic fact that, yes, they are, because we are all going to die, and the next generation will come, and they will be the ones that are alive and leading in our churches, and our families, and society. And so uh, building them up in the faith is really a, a way of influencing the future and future generations. Just imagine the fruit of 20 years of consistent family worship together with children. You know, what impact that will make on their faith and then what impact that will prepare them to make on their culture and their society around them. So these are our motives for family worship. I hope that you can identify with them and, and, and it moves you to be like, yeah, this is something I want to desire to do. But before we get into the actual practice, that, that model that we're going to get in the next couple weeks, we're going to look at the Bible this morning. So if you have your Bibles, um, you can open them up. We're going to look at a number of passages. We're not going to spend you know, forever in each passage, but just a number of them to see how this is kind of built in to uh, God's Word. The first one is Genesis 18, 19. Uh, Genesis 18, 19. This is God speaking to Abraham, and he says this. I have chosen Abraham that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. You see that? He chose Abraham and the commission that he gave him was to command his children and his household after him so that they may follow the way of the Lord. Now, in Abraham's time, there really was no you know, established institution of the church, right? Abraham didn't have a temple or a tabernacle to go to like the later Israelites did. What we see is the patriarchs going around, and, and really it's the patriarchs themselves that are leading you know, the church of their family. That's what we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doing, building altars, worshiping God together as a family. And so... Almost before we see, you know, a kind of a formal church, we see the worship of God in families. Let's just go to another text. This is probably one that you've thought of um, before, but this is significant coming in Deuteronomy 6, uh, the center of the law, the Shema. Um, this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your hearts. Now, this is significant because by this time, Deuteronomy takes place, what has happened? Um, what's what's, what's the, the book, a couple books before Deuteronomy, the second book in our Bible, what's that title? Exodus, right? If you're reading through the Bible, I'm not sure if you're going, you know, just Genesis through Exodus, you might be in Exodus now. Um, but if you've ever read Exodus, you know, we got the plagues at the beginning, right? Those are fun. Those are exciting. Then we have kind of Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. But does anyone remember what like the second half of Exodus is about? What do you read a lot of in the second half of Exodus? Laws? Want, yeah, lots of sin, Brian. But what are these laws specifically about? They're given instructions on, on how to build something, right? The tabernacle. And it's funny, you read Exodus, and first you read God giving Moses all these detailed instructions about how to build the tabernacle. And then you read all these detailed accounts of them following those instructions. So you get like everything twice in Exodus. Like the second half of Exodus is generally, you know, about building the tabernacle. So by the time Deuteronomy comes, the people have this tabernacle. They have a place to worship God corporately. This is like, you know, formally instituted. They have the sacrifices and the priests. And yet, God still commands the Israelites that they should teach his word to their children and talk of them when you sit in your house. It's not a replacement for the ongoing family worship of God, teaching his word, discussing it as families. You know, when they sit down to eat, when they get up, before they go to bed, that doesn't repl- isn't replaced by the tabernacle and the more formal um, corporate worship. Another text, we're just going to go through these fa- fairly quickly. This is from Joshua, right? Joshua, this is a famous one. Um, if you go, uh, I, I think this is the one, correct, Emily, that's at your parents' house. This is Emily's dad's favorite verse at the end. It's above their door and all these different places. This is Joshua um, at the end of his life, talking to Israel for what they're to do after him. And this is what he says. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away all the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And then this is key. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, notice what he says. He doesn't just say, but as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. He says, as for me and my house. Joshua here is speaking as the leader of his family and his house. He says, we will serve the Lord the Lord. It's not exclusively an individual claim, but it's a claim about him and his family that this is what they will do together. Um, A few more texts. Uh, This one is long, so if you can't read it up there, you can open your Bibles to Psalm 78. Yeah, you probably can't read that. I don't even try. You'd have to get a magnifying glass. Psalm 78 verses 1 to 8 is a psalm that maybe we haven't thought of, but when you read it in this context, it, it is pretty clear about what um, worship should look like among families. Listen to this. The psalmist writes, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ways to the words of my mouth. In other words, listen up. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that have that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. So there, he's already saying, listen to me, I'm going to tell you what was passed down from the prior generation to us. And then he says this, we will not hide from them from their children, but tell to the generation coming the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their forefathers, stubborn and rebellious, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. What is envisioned here? There's many generations here. There's at least four generations spoken of in this psalm. 
It's the generation that was past. Our fathers, they told things to us, the second generation, which we have told, we will tell to our children so that our children could tell them to their children. You know, this is passed on from generation to generation. And then notice there, I have in green, the two purposes that he has after all this. Two purposes. That they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commands. Right? That should be our hope, right? We want the next generation to be one that sets their hope in God, remembers him, and keeps their, his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. So that's kind of the opposite of that. We see this four-generational thing going on. Now, one more I believe, text, and then, and then we're going to um, talk a little more about this. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Sure. Now, I want you to think for a moment. In all of these texts, who has been the principal person spoken to and commanded to be kind of the one that is going to be um, leading his family uh, in worship. You know, generically. I mean, I know there's different individuals, but who in the family is, is given that primary commission? It's the father, right? Abraham, Joshua, in, in our text in Psalm uh, four, uh, 78, it's, it's speaking of the fathers. Here again, Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that mothers are unimportant or that mothers kind of get a free pass. And we can say, ah, I have nothing to do with this. In fact, no, that's, um, we read elsewhere in the Bible of Timothy. And remember who was key in Timothy's conversion and knowledge and growth in the faith? Well, it was his mother and his grandmother. So we read of, of that as well. But the responsibility, you know, the one who really bears the responsibility for seeing that this happens in his family is the fathers. Um, it's the fathers and extended, the, you know, grandfathers have a responsibility as well. We're not, not as immediate as the fathers, but to see that their family is walking in the way of the Lord. So this is the model we're going we're gonna to do. We're going to talk about reading, singing, and praying. Um, and I want to emphasize, this is something that you can incorporate into your private devotional life as well. Um, we're going to talk about how to read God's word, how to read it fruitfully. Um, I don't know about you, but I have, you know, read through, you know, you read through portions of scripture. And sometimes you read them and you just think, what was that about? And what do I take away from that, right? If you get to, you know, First Chronicles, right? Remember how First Chronicles starts? You get nine chapters of genealogies. All right, my suggestion to you, which we'll get there, is maybe don't choose those nine chapters as a scripture text for your family worship. I mean, they're not that they are not the inspired word of God, but there are some that are perhaps more helpful to read. But we're going to look at how can we read scripture and make it useful to us? Um, how can we read it and make it useful to us? Um, and we're going to look at tools. I uh, have some tools to help you out in that regard to recommend to you. And then we're going to look at singing. Now, this is probably the one that sticks out to you as odd, right? This is probably the one that you're like, huh, I don't know about that, Taylor. I'm not a singer. Kind of like, leave that aside. I leave that to other people. Well, I would recommend this to you as a crucial element, especially if you have little kids. Little kids, um, for example, you know, I know this because I have them. Arena won't sit still very long to hear, let me read a couple chapters of scripture. Even a full chapter would be a lot for her. But you know what she will do? She'll sing a song. She, uh, you know, just the other day at dinner, we have two hymns up on our walls. And she was showing us how she knows the first whole verse to be thou my vision. And she would sing it. And then she tried to sing the first verse to crown him with many crowns. I think it like merged into a different song. But, you know, but we have videos of her also singing holy, holy, holy. Um, and, you know, she loves that hymn, and those are the things that stick in her mind, and she'll sit, and she'll sing with us through all of them. That, you know, it's so fun to see. In fact, I have a funny story about Arena that 
I've, I've been, you know, I saved it. It'll work its way into a sermon at some point when I get the right text, you know. But there was one time when Arena was, I forget why, but she was sad and she was crying and inconsolable. And we were sitting on our couch in the living room. And I don't know if I suggested this to her or if she just started, but she started while she was like visibly upset singing holy, holy, holy. <laughs> Um, and it just was, it, you know, I thought in the moment, like, wow, this is a good uh, lesson for me that even when you don't feel like it, you know, to be praising God, that's what she was doing. Uh, but I don't know if she knows. She does not know really all of that she's doing. But, but those are the things that really stick uh, for her um, is the song. So uh, we'll talk about that. We'll even practice some singing together. I know that might be scary, but we're going to do it, and it'll be okay. And I have lots of tools for that one. That's probably the one I have the most tools for, because it's probably the hardest. Um, neither Emily or I really knows how to play any instruments. Uh, we had a piano. We gave it to my sister, because she knows how to play the piano, and, and we don't. We, you know, we could plunk out. Mary had a little lamb, but that's about the extent of it. But there's tools to help. We're going to talk about those tools in a couple weeks. And then, lastly, we're going to talk about prayer. Uh, prayer together. How can we pray together as a family? This is another one that's um, uh, a great blessing to do as a family. We're going to talk about, you know, how can we do it that in a way that incorporates the family? Um, what are the tools we can use, you know, to help us pray well? Uh, what are the things that we should be praying for? And how can we make this a time of joyful prayer for our families? We're going to talk about all of those things. And I hope this makes you excited. Um, I want to also say another thing before we wrap up, and that is I really hope you don't see this as me coming across like I have this figured out, and now you just need to do what I have already figured out. Um, I have not figured it all out, um, and it is something that we have grace for that, yeah, there's going to be days and times when you don't and you miss or where it's just too busy and things overtake your life, um, this is more an ideal to be striving for um, rather than something that, you know, if you miss, then you're, you know, failing in your duties. I'm, I, it's a struggle. I know it can be a struggle with kids. It can be a struggle without kids. Emily and I uh, were doing this before we had kids, and it was sometimes hard to fit it, to, you know, fit in because life is busy. And I'll tell you, your mind Kind of like when you think, well, you know, I'm going to pray now. What does your mind do? Probably all, half of our minds do this, probably most of our minds. You sit down, you're going to pray. What does it do? It immediately brings a thousand other things to mind. Everything that you did yesterday, everything that you need to do today, everything for the next week, the things you forgot, the texts you didn't respond to, the emails. You know, a lot of times when you think, you know, all right, let's, let's do family worship. Everything else comes to bear. So we need to have grace here. We need to have grace. So. I'm going to give you some homework. This is homework for you. I know, right? But this is Sunday school, so I feel like I'm uh, able to do that. Give you some homework. The homework for this week is only to pick a time. Pick a time where you think that, yeah, we could do consistent, regular family worship at this time. Um, and maybe say that time should be, let's just say 20 minutes, all right? Um, I don't think you should try to extend it to like a 45-minute, you know, service or, or longer than, you know, that's too much. But try to pick a time where you can have 20 minutes. That is the only homework this week. I, it's not even homework to have family worship this week. It's just to try to pick a time. And my advice would be attach it to something else, right? You already have a routine in your day. You probably eat dinner around the same time every day. You probably go to bed around the same time every day. Attach it to something else um, that's already built into your routine. That's the easiest way. kind of gets over that hurdle of adding something new. It's just uh, attach it onto something else. So as we close, I know we're actually a little bit early, but I'd be interested in hearing maybe from some of the uh, older generation who have had the chance to raise children already, um, how did you find, um, as you tried to raise your children and lead them in reading scripture and, and praying with them, were there things that worked well for you or things that um, you learned along the way? 
give a chance for some of the older fe- folks to share. I've only got a few ex- years of experience, so not much. I bet, yeah. And that's, that's another thing to remember. It's like, you know, as parents, we'll probably always feel like we're, we could do more. You know, that's probably just our nature. But, you know, what our job is is not to be perfect. We won't be. Um, but to, to try to, to teach our kids these. And, and I'm sure they do remember that, yeah. You know, they probably remember as, oh, like, I remember being given mom and dad the ringer when they were trying to pray. But they remember that you were praying with them. <laughs> yeah. But I like the idea of doing it in the car because they're strapped down and they can't move. It's like, it's like a hostage, you know. <laughs> but that's a good thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's an important point I, I want to emphasize as well is um, you, can only, you can only give what you have. You can't give what you don't have. And so an important kind of precursor to leading families, uh, leading kids, you know, to in, in um, their walk with Christ is that we are taking that time ourselves as well and, and spending time in prayer and, and reading our word um, and, and making sure that our walk with Christ is vibrant and, and we're giving it the, the time it deserves. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to be flexible um, especially when you're doing it with kids because they change. Um, I know it changed a lot for Emily and I how it looked before we had Arena. Um, you know, when we were able to do it, we were able to sit down uninterrupted and have a conversation and read and pray and, and do all this stuff together. It was great. It was like, wow. Um, and then after you have, the, you know, we had Arena and no more. Um, the time we get uninterrupted is after she goes to bed. So... And that's when we are able to do to do more together. But with her, it's it's going to look it looks very different. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. Very insightful. All right. So as we close, I'm I'm going to tell you. So I have some resources. You guys are the lucky ones. You get materials if you want them. I have a whole bunch of this little pamphlet, family worship. And lest you're afraid, like that's how that's how long it is. Okay. And it's small pages um, to pick up if you'd like. And I have another one. This is, is uh, slightly bigger, but it's not very long as well. You know, not too long. This is just a collection of different uh, people's writings on family worship. Um, it's got uh, some from John Patton, um, that missionary I mentioned. Um, it's got two uh, little essays from him. Um, it's just kind of a collection of different writings on family worship. And, and these are, are good to have just to encourage you and give you ideas and, and you know, help you understand, you know, the motives for it. So I'm going to take these and I'll just stand back there. And if you want them, come get them and you can have two, one of each um, for anyone who wants them. So I'm going to close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we begin this series, we pray for your help. But I pray that you would help us uh, as families and as individuals to have vibrant walks with you. We pray that it would be refreshing to spend time uh, in worship, not only individually and not only as a corporate body, but, but with our families. And that's something that we could look back on years from now and see the blessings and the fruit that you have brought from it. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.